interest in spherical chicken. Um, those, those of you who don't know, uh, Jana's a research fellow in Conservation Planning Group. She had a very important role. She's supporting two projects, really important projects, that involve working with uh, national parks managers to make decisions about how to set management priorities. And uh, right at the core of that, both of those projects is a new decision support tool that uh, Jana set up. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody who, who made it to my seminar and who's interested in what is this spherical chicken. Uh, so, as Bob mentioned, we are developing a new decision making support uh, software for conservation managers. It is coming actually from their side, it is not that we would decide uh, just uh, from our academic reasons that we just want to do it because we can. So this project is actually linked with the massive data elicitation and we do it in cooperation with them. Also. Um, so uh, the outline of today's presentation uh, will uh, mention what, what are we going to do, what the new software is going to do and why, is it, why we are developing a new thing while we already have some software. And uh, what we have and what we need sort of question you need to answer. Then I will describe the, the problem, especially I mentioned the sub-models uh, sub like threat, actions and costs, and mention extent uh, of the problem and expectation of the speed. Uh, then I will introduce you the, the constraint model, which is the core of the, of the software, and tell you something about the source which we are aiming to use, and show you some results of the test. Then the next step, which, which we want to do, to give some a little bit more space to the chicken, and maybe we can even go to the summary. So what we have uh, in this program, this, this project is focused on islands. Uh, one of the advantages of islands is that we don't really have beaches which are running across the island. So we have our areas which are quite uh, isolated. We are going to, in some point, we want to introduce their reintroduction and crossing uh, among the islands, but not in this point right now. So we have a set of islands, as Bob mentioned, in Pilbara region in West Australia and in GDR. Then we have TN. So we need to describe it with tables. One massive tables which we have is features on island. Features are our animals and, and plants which are subject to our protection. It's usually native ones. Then we have threats, which are animals and plants which are threatening, basically eating up our features, which are usually introduced, introduced uh, species like rats, cats, goats, lantana, bees, and all these things. We, have, we need threats, an island table uh, with abundances as well as the features on islands, and then we need interaction in between the threat and the features, means how many of features are eaten up by this particular threat. And then we have actions. So action is something which suppresses our threats and that's really how we protect our features. Uh, the action can be killing cats or spraying wheat and these sort of things. Each action has costs. So we have two more tables. One will be efficiency of actions on the threat and cost of the action. So this is the input to what we have and what, do we, what we need. Uh, the software needs to work in two regimes. One is if we have uh, minimized the total cost of our objectives. Let's say we want to get this many of protective features or this habitat and how much is it going to cost. The second uh, scenario is minimize the amount of features with threats removed for a given budget. And this is the most typical way how the, the managers work. They have a budget and they want as much as possible. This needs to be done in some time, uh, time range and time resolution. Usually we would get like three to five years and time step would be probably one year. Uh, so what is the difference in between the current and, and, uh, uh, and our software? 
the most the uh, the most painful thing about the current software is that they all simplify, which actually we are going to do too. But we would like to actually push this simplification into another level of complexity to overcome uh, as many of these simplifications as we, as we can. One simplification is that they simplify multiple threads and multiple actions. So we only have one thread, we don't have multiple. They simplify interference amongst actions. Uh, they almost all spatial variation and intensity of threat, cost of actions, and responses of species and other features to the management intervenience, and they simplify the dynamic nature of threats and they respond to the action. So this we would like to capture a little bit better. Uh, the framework which we, we are working on is captured by this little table. So we first need to have some guiding principles, some idea how is it going to look. We need to elicitate the data, which is actually a huge part of the project, and it's nothing which I really do, it's, it's the thing which MEI is doing. And without this data, this, this software is sort of, the, the presence of the data is of course vital for the software. Uh, then we need to make up our minds with uh, some weightings of the features which are important, which are not. And then introduce threads. We need to line up the objective, which is actually not as easy as it is said to, to explicit nicely what are the objectives and how do we, how do we say it to the computer. Uh, of course, we need to slice it and then we go to uh, actions. We end up with formulation and by application we do monitoring and that is the the end of the loop when we, by monitoring, we get feedback and see next year after two years how it worked, whether it was as we were expecting and so on. Uh, so I would like to, these three blocks include something which we call uh, sub models and it means that these things are a bit more complicated so we need to check it out and make, uh, make it more elaborate. So the first is threats. What is included in the threats are models? Uh, it is not as easy to lay down abundances and, in, and interference of the threats and species. It's actually quite complicated. So that's what we would like to capture with the sub models. There is a big difference in between established and introduced threats. Established if we, if we see the abundance, it looks like that. Is it, uh, the, the population of threats reach some saturation and it's not changing. The population of features, we are eating up. If any remain, it's pretty much stable. Complete different situation is when we introduce new feature, new threat. If we introduce, let's say, cats to an island, the population will shoot up probably exponentially if they have what to eat. And the population of the features they are eating up will go down quite often exponentially too. And now there is, in, there is very different situation whether we are sitting here when there is just a little bit of threat and a lot of food for them or when we are here where the, where the, the threat is already pretty much spread and there is just a little tiny bit of the food for them. So as most of people know, probably except of banks and fishermen, that exponential growth is not sustainable. So the threads will actually not keep growing like this till ever, but they will come to a limit where they already add up everything and they have nothing much to eat anymore. And we hit saturation. So this is a typical curve which we expect from an introductive species. And now we need to know again from elicitation how the curve looks. It, it may be pretty fast and it may be quite slow and we may not see in the horizon of a couple of years the saturation at all. Another big thing is interaction in between threat and species. So this is, uh, if we take for simplicity a linear growth of threats in time, this is the way how the features can react. They can start falling down and get completely eaten up by the threat. They can start falling down and keep some little, little population, for example the birds which will be nesting on trees where the cats never reach, so they will always survive hum whatever abundance of cat is there. Or it can take them actually some time to react and then they can do all these sort of curves. Eradication or, or uh, this sort of dashed curve. So we also need information about this, this, uh, this uh, dynamic of the nature. 
And another submodel is actions and cost of actions. So what are the problems with actions? As I mentioned, we don't have one action for one threat, we have sub-actions. So we can do shooting, baiting, trapping of goats or cats, all these awful things. Uh, and this action can interact to sub-actions. We have multiple actions too. If we put bait to, to poison cats, then there are other species which eat them and die, foxes, but also our sea, sea nesting, uh, our seabirds, for example. So we need to think twice whether that is what we want to do if we knock down our, our target species, our target feature to whether it's worth it, because if we knock down the, the, the threat faster than, the, than them, their population may rebound. <coughs> Especially if this project is species, we need to be careful about that. Cost. Uh, cost is actually also a bit complicated because cost will break down. We never had one cost for one action. It will break down into fuel, wages, accommodation for the people, into the hardware like base and all the renting of the helicopter and all this stuff. And it's a big difference whether we have two offshore islands. Once we are there, the, the fuel may get significant, maybe significant uh, part of the cost. So once we are there, we may take care of more islands, or we may do more stuff on the islands. So uh, Robo, for example, does not tolerate this. You do this thing on this island, and that is a cost, full stop. So that's one of the main uh, main things which we want to, to capture by the software. Another headache is that cost of eradication actually depends on the density of the threats. And Especially if we work with vertebrates, which are smart animals, and they have just learned. Aerial shooting is a wonderful example. It will knock down half of the population of goats or whatever we shoot. But next time we go there by helicopter, they already know they will hide. So the efficiency goes to, to quite low numbers very soon. So we need to change the actions, and we need to take into consideration this too. And also we have this beautiful and annoying uh, rule in conservation science that first ninety percent eradication of first ninety percent of abundance costs ten uh, percent and the most expensive is to get the last cat or last goat from the island. So in this point we need to we need to think well does it really worth it to go for eradication to this island or is it better to get uh, to get to control and do control on more islands? So this is one of the, the questions which you want to answer. Um, another thing is that removal of the threat may affect other than target features. For example, goat and lantana is a beautiful example. If we eradicate goats from an island because they are eating our native plants, we may get spread of lantana and it will kill the plants anyway. Or if we have uh, birds which are eaten up by rats and cats, we eradicate the rats, cats will jump on the birds, eat them anyway. We eradicate the cats, rats will uh, will breed, will the, the population will grow, and they will eat the birds anyway. So we need to take care of what is around, not only the targeted threat or target species. And also, uh, it sh the software should have a little click on sort of compulsory actions, because there are things which we can't simply capture by the model, and this is decision-making support for the, the managers. They may have reason which are political or whichever, and it's not our job to assess this. And they may say, well, whatever you say, whatever efficiency is, I want to do this on that island, or I don't want to do, for example, you have island with people, you, you don't really want to go aerial shooting there. So they will click, not really. And it, it's not a big deal, but it, it just should be, should be there. So what is the extent of the problem? How many, pro how many islands we have? For GBR, we have minimum like 160 islands with uh, roughly 40 features and 25 threats. And the, the amount of action is sort of 30, but that will break down in much larger number as we are, we will be uh, breaking down the cost. And time horizon is like three to five years. For Pilbara region, we have something like 600 islands, but some of them are just rocks, so efficiently 400 islands, and the rest would be roughly the same. Uh, expect, expected speed of the software, it's a, a little bit sensitive uh, question. 
So of course we expect that it will work pretty fast. But with this level of complexity, it may get to really bizarre times. So we need to find the, the compromise and we need to find proper solver and proper methods how to do that. And for this, we, can, we may find useful to have two solvers. One will be heuristical and one will be the proper one. Which, uh, so heuristical, uh, the disadvantage is that it's faster and we can basically, uh, basically finish it anytime we want. Uh, the disadvantage is that it does not really guarantee the optimal solution. Uh, and so the idea of this would be it would give the, the managers informed guess and it would be for them to play with that, like trying different setups, trying different commitments and so on. Once they have an idea, they can go for the proper solver, which will show them whether this is actually really the optimal solution or not. Uh, the advantage of optimal solution is that it will find the best solution. This is implication. If, if the solution exists, it will find it. This implication has a reverse sentence. If it doesn't find the optimal solution, it means there is none. Uh, this advantage is that it takes long time usually. And we can go via two, two basic ways. Either use imperative language, like C++ and library G-code, sometimes it is, or go via logic language, for example, Prolog. Uh, for, for the uh, kind of new thing which we are using for this software is the way how we model it. Because, and, and we do it by a constraint model. And the reasons are to either transparency of the solution which we can get. And it's one reason. The second reason is that if you want to do this proper solver in this, uh, this logical languages, they do in, uh, uh, they work as a constraint, uh, constraint problems. Uh, what is a constraint problem? Normally we have in modeling, we have some equations and time evolution of the things, of the threads and species and interactions. Constraint model works in a bit different way. It just lays down constraints. It says how they, the, the variables and the things are interlinked or how they are not. It's like if you saw Sudoku or timetable, you have constraints. This teacher can't teach in two rooms uh, simultaneously and so on. So this is the, the constraint way, way of, of thinking. And how do we lay down our, our model in constraints? So the objectives are reached as constraints and the variables are actions on the island. So what we are looking for is the best combination of actions on the islands, which would fulfill our constraint, which is either budget or limits of, or our requirement of protected species. And in this way, it's very simple to put it. It's just another constraint. Another, another complex thing, another level of complexity is just another constraint. So in this way, it's, it's Quite easy. Uh, how the two scenarios will look. Scenario one, uh, minimizing the total cost. Solver minimizes the cost and it only takes solutions which fulfill our requirements for the protected species. Scenario two, we have a budget. So the constraint this time will be a budget and we maximize the, the amount of, of features. Why don't we do it as uh, Martin and Robo? Uh, these things are really efficient in what they are doing, but as I said, they use a lot of simplification. And how they work is they put the whole, the whole word into one equation and they run simulated annealing. The way how they take care that they meet their requirements is they are using penalty. And I would like to avoid this because using penalty is a black magic. And it's, they apparently did, did fantastic job in what they are doing they have special method how to establish penalty. Because in order to, you need to get the penalty so high so this solution never makes it. So you need to make the penalty bizarre. But if you make it too bizarre, it won't work too. So there will be a special algorithm just to assess the penalties. And for our level of complexity, I don't think this is going to work. This is much, this concept is much more simple. Uh, so how, how do we, how do we actually model the ecosystem with just constraints? We take it as a one piece and slice it in time. So what we do is we put constraints in between 
pitches and frets from year one to year two, there will be one constraint. From year two to year three, there will be another constraint. And that's how we capture the model. So uh, how do we do these little arrows, these little constraints on threads? What are, they, uh, what are threads going to do on ions? Threads are going to breed, and they are going to be killed by our actions. So that's what this equation is saying. <laughs> it's simple, actually. It's, it's just a lot of indices. So this is threads in time one. It's this year on island one. Is thread last year on this island plus what they breed means the threat last year times some coefficient of breeding, let's say 20%, whatever. Minus this thing is simply saying what is, at, what is killed by our, by, our, uh, by our actions. So this threat times this, uh, this is what is there this year. This coef is coefficient of efficiency of our action, let's say 80%, 50%, depends. And this y is action in time one on island one. And this is action of the thread. In this model, uh, we have only one action per one thread. If we get more of them, this blue thing will, will be a little bit, slightly bit more complicated. This Y will be expressed as this. We simply need to multiply the, the effect of multiple actions, if any. Um, y is zero or one which is pretty simple with this software. Uh, zero means I'm not going to do anything. So this all member is zero. One is I do the action, so I suppress the population. Features will be exactly the same story. They breed and they are killed by the, by the threat. So the equation will be features this year are features last year plus what they breed it minus what was added by the threat. Uh, and in this member, we need to stop all these equations and all these interaction in between threat and species. In this very case, uh, we have a coefficient which is telling us how many birds will be eaten up by a cat. That's a very, or by this particular, particular threat. That's a very big simplification. Uh, another constraint in this case is we need to make sure that this thing, this me all member, is smaller or equal these things before, otherwise we have we have negative animals running around, and we don't really want to want that. So this is a simple idea: how we just interlink the threat and the species, and run it as one whole piece. And one advantage of running it as one whole piece is that if you do it year by year, you will always go for the most cost-efficient action this year, and you will never see, as I said, some of the features they will take some time when I start killing the, the, the threat, they will take some time to even react. It may take two, three years when I see rebounds of the features. And this is sort of thing which I never get if I go year by year. I can do commitment, let's say eradication of this for three years. But another answer which I would like to, uh, the software to, to answer, the question which I would like the software to answer is, what is the best commitment? Is it? Eradication, is it control? Should I go there every year, every two years, twice a year? So that's why it's it's big advantage to 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 solve it like one piece. Now I would like to talk uh, just to tell you a little bit glimpse of my of our soft, uh, solver. So the heuristical solver which we are just developing is uh, based on genetic algorithm. It has been published that it. Genetic algorithm is quite comparable with AnyLink. AnyLink is maybe a little bit better for, for the stuff which Martin and Robot is doing. But the advantage of genetic algorithm is it's extremely straightforward and transparent, the way how we formulate the problem. We can't do this thing in AnyLink. Genetic algorithm uh, was first published in 1962, and it's quite kind of standard, uh, one of the optimization heuristic algorithms. It's inspired by the way how Mother Nature is doing our natural selection of us. It wants the strongest individuals to breed and give us kids, and again, select the strongest from the kids to breed further. So 
uh, what are the types of the, of the problems we use genetic algorithm for, especially if we have massive amount of solutions and we just can't go through all of them. So it will be if we have like 600 or 400 ions, we may get into this stage when it's just too complex and there's too many of options. Quite often it is in multi-dimensional, so no way we can even sort of visualize it in a decent way. So imagine that you have, this is the, the space of solutions and you want to find the best bags out of those. Yeah, and you can't really take and measure everyone how, how far they fly. It's just impossible. So what do you do? You do some smart selection, uh, amount which you can actually assess and exercise. And those, this will be our first generation. You just put them on a tree and start doing exercise with them. For our problem, we have this constraint. So we have feasible and unfeasible. For example, if we have a budget, we only take bags who are cheap enough. So the, these guys are too expensive, so we just get rid of them straight. The rest we will put into something which is called mating pool, and we will take randomly to individuals, let them mate, and put the kids into the new generation. Uh, the way how we assess, uh, how we select the individual is, we assess their quality. So the biggest, strongest, will get high probability uh, to be selected. That's called roulette. So we just, for each and every bet, these four guys have this roulette, and for selection, I randomly toss a ball into this roulette, and which one it hits, that bet is selected to make. Uh, then I have two individuals which produce two kids, and these kids go to the next generation. And I keep doing this until I again fill this branch, this tree, and that will be my new, new generation. And that is called one iteration. I do as many iterations as I want until I get bored or it actually converges or until, you know, usually, usually it is when it stops changing the, the best solution, it means that it probably found the, the best it can do. So how do we apply this to our problem with the islands? We take the threat on islands table. So as we want to do actions on islands, we want to see which threats we are, we are uh, influencing by the action. This is present absence, normally we would have abundance. So wherever we have present threats on an island, that would be, be, uh, that would be uh, one gene of our individual of our chromosome in our, uh, uh, in our algorithm. First of all, we uh, threw away irrelevant things. So, so we will only take care of, if there is no rats on Heron Island, we won't even think about killing rats on Heron Island, right? So in order to limit, to have as less constraints as we can, we need to select only the relevant, uh, relevant combinations. Let's say that house sparrow on Lady Elliot Island does not threaten anything. So we don't need to do any actions on them to it would be random. It wouldn't it wouldn't bring any protected species. So we throw it away. We line them, let's say, house mouse on Heron Island, uh, overpopulation of server ghoul on Heron Island, and so on. We align it under each other. An action on that thread on that island would be one gene of my individual, or we, we say chromosome. Again, we, we get rid of these redundant things, and this would be one of my solution. It's a chromosome with zeros and one, with the, and each gene is saying which action will be on which island. Then, like this, we randomly select uh, as many, we randomly select our, our individuals into the first generation. Here we have six, normally we have like 100 or whatever you want. And we, again, assess feasibility and first of all, throw away what is unfeasible. And then we assess uh, the quality and put the, the rest of them into mating pool. Usually what we do is that we take the best one and get them to the next generation straight because we want to make sure that we won't get anything worse than we already have. 
So the bad guys will just walk into the, into the next generation. But still they will contribute in the mating pool because we really want their genotype. And then we take randomly two, uh, two individuals, we randomly draw a line and we swap these parts of the, of the gene and those will be new kids. So this part, this will be our two second individual in the next generation, this plus this will be third, and so on. And we keep doing that until we fill the next generation. Another quite important thing is mutation. Uh, some of the solutions we just can't, because it's a random process, we randomly select uh, some guys, and nobody is saying that the best one is among them. And we may come into the point where we don't, can't really get the best one, otherwise then we randomly uh, accidentally change uh, some of the genes. The probability is low, but it's quite important to avoid de degeneration, which we call third stagnation. It's like in nature, usually mutation would screw up sometimes, the mutants do a really good job. Again, we assess feasibility and quality and so on, and we iterate it until like, we find the solution which we are happy about. The other solver is the, the, uh, the, in the constraint solver in logic language. So this is an example of a prolog code. I really like it. This is the, and the idea is quite different. You just lay down the constraints. It's like if I tell you, please bring me a cup from a kitchen. And you, do, you need to go and find the kitchen and find the cup. That's the way how I program in constraint programming. The constraint uh, languages, have already incorporated solvers, so they know what to do. If I use imperative language, I actually need to know where is the kitchen, I need to tell you which sort of cup, where it is, I need to tell you get up, go at the end, open the door, and all these sort of things. You don't need to do it with this. You just lay down the constraints. So this would be constraint about the threads, that would be features, like this one is one, it's like for two lines. This is constraint for targets, definition of cost, and this little thing is just telling you, you minimize this thing with these uh, variables. If you do it for four years, uh, for 12 islands, you get it like 10 pages. Maybe five if you have really, really fun. <laughs> and so this is a little, little uh, example from, uh, from the prolog server, which I'm experimenting on too, and it's actually good. Um, the way, well, okay, this, uh, this is a black box, you run it and you get number of zeros and ones. And now you need to say, all right, so what does it mean? And also, well, another thing, if it doesn't find a solution, then there is something wrong and it's pretty difficult to debug it and it's pretty difficult actually to see what is it doing. So what I do is I run parallel model for both the solvers, genetic algorithm and the prolog to see what the hell is actually happening during, during the process. What does my actions on an island mean in the real world? So what I want to see is the system, the abundances of threads on islands and abundances of features on islands. And that is these little curves. So also to see uh, how the model works. I want to see if I don't do anything, what I get. If I do everything, what I get. And that's the way how I can assess like how good I was in the solver. So I need to, to get the boundary to say where I am. So this is the case where I don't know anything anywhere. Left panel is always top is threads, bottom is features. This is one thread on one island. This is all threads. Uh, this is one thread on all islands. This is one feature on one island. This is all features on one island, so overall sum of features. Here I can see that the threads are happily breeding up and the features are not very happy about it. This, uh, this, thing, this uh, legend is showing us how many percent of each feature I get protected after this period. So I see that some of them are just adding up completely. But some of them, they're actually happily 173% they are actually growing, the population is growing. It means that probably there is no threat, or the population is so big that the threat doesn't manage to eat them up. So this is an important, uh, 
important information. If I want to be happy, oh, I was, I was so fantastic. Actually, some of the features would survive even without my intervening. The next uh, interesting question is, if I do everything everywhere, I really do, I have all the money in the world, this is the, the best I can do ever. So what is the result I get? So the threats obviously are uh, declining and the features are basically inclining. Some of them are enough anyway, just because there were too little of them and the threats add them up anyway, how, whatever I do. Um, this number is important. It is overall protected. I just average uh, by brutal force, I average this, this percentage of each feature and I get an overall protected uh, species. If I don't do anything anywhere, I get 46% are surviving. If I do everything anywhere, everywhere, I get 75. So this is the, the, uh, the boundaries where I can actually make a difference. This is cost. How much did it cost? It's an important in information. How much does it cost if I do really my best? And in this case, it's like 560 for $1,000. Yeah, just a quick question. Uh, um, th those percentages obviously are going to depend on your time horizon. I'm just wondering why you get four years if you're... Um, because we, this is actually three years. The first year is always like where we are starting. Right. Okay. Because we, we do in between three and five years. So I just took three okay. to make it not too painful, not too long. And this, this is difference in between the very, before we came and after we are living. So this percentage is at the beginning and at the end. It, it doesn't matter on how many slices you have, on how many years you have. Uh, and this is finally what the solver is suggesting me. So the solver in this case is working with a budget of 400,000. The maximum is 560. So it's quite, a lot of things which it can afford to do. And this is showing up in knock down this green, knock down this green thread and so on. And this is the response of the of the features. And again, I see that I collected 61%. Uh, so yeah, one of the things which I, which I need to do is I want to see how the solvers work. I want to test them. And I want to see whether the result is meaningful or not. And this is one of the uh, one of the plots, how I learn it. It's showing us two important things. One is important for conservation people, one is important for the mathematical people. The green line is showing the percentage of a protected species, these little numbers on the top of the, of the plot. This is the minimum, means I do nothing nowhere, and this is the maximum, I do everything everywhere. And I can see that actually at the beginning it rises quite fast, and then it doesn't really matter what I do. It's all over time almost the same. It's actually quite typical curve for conservation science. I would be probably happy if it didn't, if it was a little bit slower. But it's just the way the, the model is set. And I need to say that we have some abundances of the features. But some of the consent are just uh, made up because we didn't have the data yet. And uh, it's just too simplified. So I'm not really that unhappy that it looks a bit bad. It has a shape it fixed, like that's good. And another interesting thing is how, how actually the solver, this is the genetic algorithm solver, how is it performing? Uh, this is the maximum cost, this 560,000. This pink line means that I, it's 100% of the budget. And these stars is showing the percentage of budget which I used for the solution. So if I'm near to 100%, if it means I had three and a half thousand, three hundred fifty thousand dollars, and I really use them all, and this is the result which I got. If I'm here, it means I, use, let's say I had two hundred thousand and I didn't really use the whole budget. It can mean two things: either there are redundant actions, means that I don't have any other action which would be relevant which would still be under the limit, which is the, the answer which we would like to have. Or the solver just does not, did not find a good solution. So this is, when we have, see this in a heuristic solver, then we should be suspicious. The only way how to find out which one is to get the, 
the optimal solver. And as I say, if this happens in optimal solver, it's uh, the answer number one. Uh, the way how to avoid it, avoid these sort of fluctuations with, uh, without using optimal solver is just repeat the heuristic of, it will always find a little bit different solution. So with a little bit of luck, it will smooth it out. But it's just, just the, the feature of optimal solver. So that's pretty much about how we do it, like uh, the, the software. And now, how do we run it and where do we run it? So there are two options. One option is that we would run it on the high performance uh, computer in JCU and make some sort of application or interface for the managers where can they upload their data and play with that online. Or we can make an application and let them install it like Mark Sun, you download the application, you install it on your computer and you have it offline. Advantage of the first is it would be much, much faster. Disadvantage, uh, because like this has you know, a lot of processors and stuff. Uh, disadvantage is that you need to be online to do anything. Um, input and output. Input would be sort of smart filling of tables and maps. Uh, this may be quite painful at the beginning, seeing the elicitation process, which is very painful. It may be quite a big issue, so we may need to assist the managers with this. I even remember Mariana uh, the other day complaining that even feeding her, her data to robots was quite painful and quite, quite annoying. So, but on the other hand, it's a life that that's, that's what we need to have to run the, uh, run the program. And anyway, we want to have the possibilities for them to log in or to, to put some upgrades later, and that should be simply enough. So they can actually do it without us. So they can overcome the first pain, but then they can work with them with it themselves. So they don't, don't need to be uh, screen time. Output uh, would be tables, mainly tables, what we do, where we do it, how much does it cost. But people don't really like working with tables only. So we need to have nice GIS, maps output which, which will visualize it and which will actually show you what you are doing. Uh, the question which we want to have answered are the options. So they can have, they need to have different scenarios, different options, they may not like one, prefer some, something which is a little bit uh, less efficient but from any reason they have uh, more suitable for them. And I would like to see reasons, why should you do this? because it has this impact. Why you don't do this? Because it has no impact, and so on. And also predictions, like if you do that, this is the way how you can expect the ecosystem to evolve. Uh, next step, of course, always next step will be increase the, the level of complexity. So in our case, uh, it will be replace the interaction of threads and features by realistic coefficients. This is the thing which is right now like, the most painful for me. Uh, which includes distinguishing the established and introduced threats. And then uh, multiple actions should be relatively not that, not that difficult, but also an important thing. And of course, uh, we need to work on, on the solvers simultaneously. So we can't make perfect model and then do solvers, or make perfect solver and then do, do model. The, the reason why this model is so simplified is also one thing we don't really have the data or we are in the process of elicitating them. Second reason is I want to have intuitive idea what is the system doing when I'm, I'm programming the solver because I want to have sort of control on what is the solver is giving me. If it is too complex, then I can't say anything about the, the solution I got. I can say, well, it may be true, it may be not, I have no idea. But if, if I have small amount of data, and simple system, I can say, well, this is this is a nonsense by looking at it. So this is the sort of sort of um, ongoing process which we need to push both things. We can't really do it, cut it off completely. So the summary. Uh, hopefully, you learned something about the new decision software which is being uh, developed here. 
and which is developed with a, with a close collaboration with managers and other people. It's sort of a groundbreaking project in the terms of level complexity, which is bringing some of the methods there too. And uh, the, the new method is the attempt to do uh, constraint, to implement constraint modeling. Mm -hmm. uh, we are testing two solvers. One is heuristic genetic algorithm, and the second is uh, optimal uh, in logical language. So that's pretty much it. <coughs> Could I just point out that you promised us an explanation? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for that. Well, so this, so far, this, uh, this software is exactly a spherical of chicken eh? It's coming from this joke when you have a farmer and a physicist, and uh, the farmer is asking him, look, what, are you, what is your study good for? And the physicist says, well, it's good for anything. But can you do something practical too? And he says, yeah, of course. By the way, my sister, who is now living on a farm, was asking me the same sort of question. She didn't get what a physicist can do with their education. So you say, of, of course, of course, I can do anything practical. All right, I have a chicken farm. Can you just tell me what to do so the chickens lay more eggs? So I say, yes, of course. I will, I will model it, I will get a solution for you. He will work hard for one month, two months, and they meet. And this farmer is asking, well, so what, what do I do? And the physicist says, I already have preliminary results, but it only works with spherical chickens in vacuum. <laughs> <laughs> so, and this is precisely how we work when we are capturing something, and this is precisely our our model. It's uh, our little spherical chicken vacuum, and we will slowly, slowly put some atmosphere, slowly take out some little wings, and feed, <laughs> let them run around. I'd like to think we're a bit further along than that. <laughs> I actually, I wanted to actually to join to to give him a like because I think we already have. Okay. And with the, and I cannot think uh, the genetic algorithm solver I'm doing in MATLAB, and it's apparently quite easy to to export it as an application. So already now I have a little application which you can install in your computer which doesn't have MATLAB. You just run it, and you don't need even to be programmers. And that's the concept how the software is going to to look because if the managers see any of those equations, they will just <laughs> run away. So that will be well hidden in the little. <laughs> so, um, the people related to your spherical chicken, um, one of the problems in this sort of work that we're doing using the different modelers is um, it's about uncertainty again, I guess yeah. generally it's about estimating the efficiency or the effectiveness of actions in a realistic way. Yeah. Um, is that built in some way? I mean, you got to go out and shoot cats on an island, that's not that simple. They hide and so on and so yeah. getting a effectiveness coefficient or a measure is really important to put in to give you some uncertainty boundaries. Yeah, yeah. Is that those sorts of factors built in? Yeah, actually we want to this what you have seen is uh, like deterministic. We, we just work with numbers. But another step would be to put the distribution of even the abundances, because even that data we have passed it. And actually, the efficiency of the actions is one of the really painful problems. The other day, we had a massive discussion with a conservation manager who was saying, well, actually, these guys, they learn, and they will hide, and they will do this and that. So that's what I was talking about, that the efficiency is dropping by time with the same method. So we need to change methods. And of course, we, we can't really predict. We, we probably have an idea how many of the animals we, we can knock down, but we can't really predict it. So yeah, uh, at the end of the day, the data will be passive. And the, uh, the passive. related to that in the model we're using, which is called infra, which is quite different than this in some ways, but it also has rules about not accepting miracles. <laughs> and that's a really important one, because okay. many of these systems project miracles, really. They say we can do things far better than realistically, and that's back to this uncertainty that we're far too optimistic about our ability to so that achieve, achieve the aims through shooting cats than is probably realistic. All right. So that, that miracle would be that I predict, yes, we can eradicate them. Yeah. Well, I, I would like to avoid this. So in my, in my way, it is I only can give you as good answer 
as you give me the question. I only can give you as good answer as you give me the data. So if you give me the data which are fake and which really the software will fight, find fake solutions. But if you give me data which are really pessimistic, the software will really give you pessimistic solutions. Yeah. I'll just add um, that we're going down uh, next week to Blast and we're going to be talking to um, National Parks managers, Queensland Parks, for some time, the media is pushing them about as far as you can to eliciting okay. information on species and we're going down to hit them again to talk about actions and costs and we'll be talking about exactly what you're saying. So we want to know what the response curve through time or in relation to additional effort and investment of a pest species is to a one or more actions. And, and we might even bundle those actions so there's a sequence where you do shooting from helicopter and you do ground shooting and you do something else because mm -hmm. they found out that that's a, that's a useful sequence. Mm -hmm. And inevitably there's, there's uncertainty. It's about setting realistic goals as well. So I remember one of the business we've got this goals for reducing pollutant runoff to the GBR that are totally miracles. We know that. They're not going to, we can't do it. But they're still in the modelling up to now we do it. But we're going to achieve these totally unrealistic goals. So it's goal setting that's within the bounds of feasibility, sort of. Mm. We're not expecting management actions to achieve goals of thought about it all, you know, a visionary off the planet or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? No? Nobody wants to query any of the equations? No? <laughs> Nobody wants to question the equations? Okay. Thanks very much, Anna.